North Central Phoenix was it, which was um, notable for being a, a mixed income neighborhood. And when growing up, um, what you see here is actually um, the 51 North Freeway, um, and which was being built at the time that I was living there. And actually my house is right on the other side of this big, huge wall. And what I learned early on in um, growing up there is because it was a community that um, also had um, individuals with uh, more labor um, positions, but then also with pockets of wealth, there was some agency to control how this freeway was built through the middle of our community. Um, and that meant that we were able to lobby to have a really big 20 foot wall to reduce the amount of noise from the freeway that would be experienced by the community. And then also advocate for that the, rather than just being a freeway, that they should incorporate things like art and make the bridge really pretty and also um, have art pieces installed across the freeway. And so that experience, um, I, you know, and I just kind of made this like uh, realization a few weeks back. I was like, wow, that actually, uh, that experience growing up and then also just living in the neighborhood that I was in um, really allowed me to see early on how um, uh, agency or having income and um, allowed for the community members to really have more control about what the shape of their neighborhood is. Um, that, uh, you know, my upbringing, uh, then, sorry, I'm using this from uh, the online PowerPoint, so I'm not quite as used to the animations here, but that experience made me really think about how uh, social and environmental factors impact your health. And this is pulled from the CDC's um, website about thinking about what are the contributions to population health. And what they have demonstrated that almost 50% of people's health is determined by their social conditions and the environments that they live in. And if you think about that a little bit further, um, those conditions also often contribute to the health behavior. So if you don't have access to healthy foods and vegetables, then you're not gonna be able to partake in as a healthy diet as some place where there are grocery stores with really fresh produce available. And so in, in that respect that your environment and social conditions contribute to almost 80% of your health. Um, and when we think about where investments are made, they're mostly made um, in the medications or in trying to understand genetics. Um, and so in, I went on to pursue an undergraduate career at the University of Arizona. Um, and while I was there, I took part in a group called Alternative Breaks, which was focused on service learning. And um, we would go and learn about different issues like homelessness or food insecurity or um, resources for um, people living with HIV and AIDS. And then we would do a community um, service project around that topic to help um, advance um, whatever assess uh, needs that the community felt that were needed. And then I also took a part in a, um, a health education program called FACES, which is the Fostering and Achieving Culture, Equity, and Sensitivity in Healthcare, which really brought in, to me the, and made more clear that the connection between the social conditions and, and health outcomes. Um, that actually made me, when I went to medical school, which is something that I knew I wanted to do from a very young age, I also decided to pursue a master's in public health at the same time. And while I really wanted to care for the, for the individual who was in front of me, I thought it was really important to also think about ways how we can also improve the overall care of the, of the community. Um, and at that time in my master's work, I worked with the Centers for Disease Control and with the California STD HIV and Training Center on developing a curriculum on how to focus on harm reduction to reduce transmission of HIV in high-risk communities. Um, from there, I came out here to, to, the, to San Francisco and um, was really purposeful in selecting a training program at UCSF. They're um, known for having a really top-notch internal medicine program, but they're also known for having a strong focus on the social determinants of health. And so that was one of the reasons why I came there. Um, and that was also at the time when we had the first addition to my, our family, when this is Wiley, our, our dog, um, at, at that time. Um, then I stayed here. Um, 
for uh, to get further training in um, pulmonary and critical care medicine. Um, so for, for those of you that are thinking of a career in health and particularly in medicine, it's medical school, then there's a residency program. And if you wanna to continue to specialize um, like I did, um, there's also a fellowship and I, my fellowship is in pulmonary and critical care, which means I'm a lung doctor. So I take patient, care of patients of chronic health condition, uh, chronic lung disease, and then also care for patients that are in the intensive um, care unit. Um, I also knew that uh, if I wanted to be a researcher that, uh, that looked and studied social determinants of health and the environment, I needed more training and the master's in public health wasn't enough. And so I went on to get more training and uh, attained a certificate in clinical research. Um, I also had two children during that time. And so I think it's important to emphasize that despite getting, um, um, being very career oriented and pursuing a career in medicine, life does happen and it's still an opportunity to uh, uh, expand and have a family. And these are my two kids very long time ago <laughs> now, um, but uh, was able to do that at the same time as, as having, um, uh, as uh, uh, during my training. And then at that time, I also joined um, the group of Dr. Burchard um, the asthma collaboratory. And it was a wonderful experience working with him because when he set up his um, research, he was really interested to understand how your internal factors, such as your genes, interact with your environment. So things like social determinants of health or environmental health, like air pollution. And it was through him that I started to understand how we and individuals may respond differently to different stressors that might be around us. And so here I'm just showing one, um, one research slide that we did and what this is showing on the X axis. So this axis here is um, a composite measure of socioeconomic status measured by your income, your, um, the education of the parent that was um, being interviewed and then also the insurance status. And what we found that is, which wasn't surprising and kind of um, aligned with what others have found is that as your socioeconomic status increased for our participants that were African-American, um, the risk of asthma decreased. In fact, it seemed to be protective. The wealthier you are, the more access of care you have, the better educational circumstances became, you know, your risk for asthma went down. However, what we also saw is that for our Mexican American children, that the inverse was true. Um, and that in fact, as your socioeconomic status improved, your risk for asthma also improved. And this made me really think about health and the environment a little bit more carefully and started thinking about like, well, you know, we talk about risk factors in broad strokes, but you know, if we really want to intervene and make changes, we really need to understand how these risk factors are different by the community and what are they hiding and what are they trying to tell us? So, you know, we've done some more works with our Latinx community and now it's a better understanding is that, you know, when you first come to the United States, um, your environment and upbringing may not be, have to have as much exposure to the air pollution that you now have when you're in the United States. So, you know, um, over generations of being in the United States, those children are being exposed more and more to industrialized air pollution that may have not been experienced um, from their original country of origin. Um, also, what we notice is that American diet and American behaviors are not that great for health, right? So things like smoking tend to go up, um, protective factors like breastfeeding tend to go down. And so those are things that actually contribute to the development of asthma, as we know from other studies. So this starts pinpointing, well, what can we do to protect communities to continue the healthful behaviors that they may have had before coming to our country um, and think about um, ways to do interventions, which may be very different than what we think about for maybe a different community. Um, and then, you know, I've stayed here now. I joined faculty and um, as a professor at UCSF in 2015. Um, and I was able to launch a couple of studies. One is the REACH study, which is the Richmond Environment and Asthma and Community Health Study, and our PEARL study, where we tried to understand how adverse children, adverse childhood experiences impact health. 
And these two studies provided me with a couple of other um, ways of looking at health and how it weighs, relates to the environment. And one of them is to look at all of these stressors um, as they're incurring in us as individuals, right? Like we don't experience air pollution and that's it. We experience air pollution and maybe poverty and discrimination all at the same time. So they should be studied together and understand together as opposed to one at a time. And, you know, for me, it's with the going back to the reason why I got my MPH is how do we intervene and provide communities with resources and support so they can combat the negative health effects of, of these stressors. Um, and to just kind of put this into another um, framework is that these are sort of the social or environmental determinants of health and they often figure uh, determine where you live, um, type of work you can get and the access to healthcare and the experiences occur over the lifetime. And so they can have this cumulative effect on your health. And I wanted just to take a moment to kind of de describe um, something happening out here in the Bay Area where, where um, many of us are from. And this is just looking at Alameda County as a, as a case study, just to show you. And you can, you can do this for almost any city or town in the country and you will find the exact same thing. And so right here, what you see are the asthma emergency department visits for children in Alameda County. And the darker the red, the area, the more ED visits that you're seeing. Um, and then over here, you're seeing the poverty rates um, for Alameda County. And again, the darker the areas are, the higher the rates of poverty. And just looking at this, you can see that the areas that there is more poverty, there is more emergency department visits. Now, if we take this a step further, same map over here, emergency department visits from Alameda County. Um, but here I've replaced the map looking at poverty with where there are air pollution hazards in, in Oakland area. And what you'll see is that these ports areas right here correspond to these areas right here where you see high emergency department visits. And then this last map, map is the racial and ethnic breakdown of the neighborhoods um, in Alameda. And what you'll see is that the darker red and pink areas here and here are where African-American individuals live. And then the green areas are where Latinx populations live. And what you'll see is that those are the same areas right here and right here where you're seeing high emergency department visits. So this makes you start thinking about, well, you know, when we talk about um, certain racial ethnic groups having higher rates of disease, that it's not always biologically, biologically based. In fact, it's most likely um, uh, due to these social and environmental exposures. And a lot of the times these social and environmental exposures are based on historic policies that have been made in the United States. Um, redlining has been receiving a lot of attention lately in the last four or five years. And this was a practice that stems back to the 1930s after the Great Depression as a way for the federal government to help rescue families from um, foreclosing on their homes. The loans were super popular as you could imagine um, because they were very low interest and offered families an opportunity not to lose their home. And therefore the government was like, oh crap, we need to figure out a way to figure out which communities are risky and which ones are not. And so this, they went out as risk assessors and they said, this neighborhood's risky and this neighborhood is not. The neighborhoods that were determined to be risky were outlined in red, hence the name redlining. And so here are the maps for San Francisco, Oakland area, San Diego and Los Angeles. Um, these are the areas that were redlined. The yellow areas are all so considered high risk with the green areas considered to be the least risky. We then looked at where asthma is happening now. So this is 1934 and then below it is 2015. And what you can see a practice from almost 70, 80 years ago still has influence where those previous areas that were redlined are the areas that have high ED visits um, in here. And that shouldn't be surprising because I just showed you where the environmental hazards are and where poverty is concentrated in, in the Bay Area, but you're seeing this happen from a, a policy from many years ago. 
And so now we've been really working about how do we bring youth and community voices into our work, understanding that while we may be able to identify what might be driving some of the disparities, the solutions should be coming in partnership with the community. And so in Richmond, we've been actively doing some work around youth participatory action research where we train um, young people how in research skills to help ask questions about their communities, but also to think about ways to intervene and provide um, resources. And so one of the projects we took on these last couple of years is about what makes the neighborhood providing an assets and disorder framework and where um, we had our teens be trained on research methods, including data collection. Um, and they went out into the neighborhoods and marked what were considered assets and disorders in the community. Um, and then they looked at that and they were like, well, how does this relate to asthma in our community, these, these assets and disorders? Um, and what they, at the end of the summer, they ended up presenting their results to their community um, leaders. So on their behalf, I'm sharing their results with all of you today. And what you see here is that they found that um, a feature such as that were associated with safety in the neighborhood. So like having sidewalks, having neighborhood watch signs presence, having parks and trees, um, which you see here in the light blue, um, was associated with less asthma. And those areas that were darker can seem to be the least safe, again, were the areas that had um, a higher asthma uh, ED visits. And this is important because now we're getting a little bit more granular. What are the features of the neighborhood that make it seem um, be perceived to be more safe, which is associated with less asthma? And so these are things that are actually intervenable from a city planning point of view. So it starts to get more concrete about how we can improve the environment or the built environment to improve health overall. Um, and these are opportunities to think about targets for interventions. And so this, this is our cohort um, as part of their project. They also um, applied for a mural um, for, uh, to the city of Richmond and were awarded um, their grant. Um, and what they wanted to do was to um, be able to, in art form, show some of their findings to the community members so that their community can become more aware of um, what's going on in their own environment. And so here on one side, you see the um, disorders in the community with the Chevron refinery in the back showing the statistics for asthma in the community, some trash um, uh, and overgrown fields. And then on the other side, you're seeing what they depict as assets in the community. So playgrounds, the Marin Food Bank, um, and youth um, in, in the community. And um, in the middle here, you see Dr. William Jenkins, who's been a real big advocate in the community. Um, and this was in memory of, of him and his role in, in the Richmond community. And with that, I thank you for having me here today and, um, and happy to uh, change over to our, um, uh, to answer any questions that um, people may have. Yes, thank you so, so much, Dr. Tacker. Um, I am so happy that you are here with us sharing this information, inspiring our future healthcare leaders. Thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. If not, I have, oh, there you go. Uh, what skills do you recommend developing in preparation for working in the field of environmental health? Yes, I, you know, there's um, a few programs that you can pursue in undergraduate career around environmental health. Um, I think those are really important in trying to understand. And I also think it's important to take any um, and get any training in public health. Um, and the reason why public health is really important um, is because it can teach you skills on how to do needs assessments with communities, um, how to engage with community members, um, to try to understand what, what's important. Um, there's also a, a rising number of community-based organizations that are focused on environmental justice. And so connecting with those groups in your training time um, can really help provide you with tools and a perspective from a community that I think is really helpful once you come into um, a, a more academic position or into a career in public health. Having that perspective of the community at your forefront is really important when trying to move forward in, in addressing, addressing environmental injustice. 
Thank you. Where should we seek out opportunities involving public health after college? Yes, so I mentioned WANDA. So one is with community-based organizations that are thinking about environmental justice or social determinants of health. Um, the others are looking for internship opportunities that are through um, academic universities that are around um, your area. And so looking at positions that are being posted such as like assistant CRC positions are a great one because you don't need to come in with research experience but you end up being able to work with scientists or academics that are doing this type of research and start learning about, about those opportunities. Um, there's also opportunities through the Departments of Public Health. They often um, post uh, opportun uh, jobs and uh, uh, opportunities around um, interning, especially around the summertime and during the school year. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker. If anyone has any more questions, please fill out that post survey. We encourage you to do so to not only give us feedback, but also receive all the contact information of all our speakers today. Thank you so much. Let's take uh, another photo. I see more people turned on their cameras. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Oh, a couple more. Ready? One two, three. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you in the next uh, session.